Well, let me encourage you this morning to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Second Peter today, chapter 2. We are in a verse-by-verse study of this chapter, a series entitled Ravenous Wolves. The Lord Jesus warned us, beware of false teachers who are ravenous wolves. And Second Peter chapter 2 is just a brilliant, high-definition description, a picture, if you will, crystal clear as to who false teachers are and what lies ahead for them. I've said in previous weeks, the, the book, the, the chapter here of 2 Peter 2 can be summed up in a sentence. I'm going to tweak that sentence a little bit from what I've been saying in previous weeks. But, but here is what Peter is saying in this chapter. That false teachers can be identified. They will be judged. Therefore, they should be avoided. Peter is pressing the point home to us that the issue of false teachers, this is not a light thing. This is not merely a matter of opinions and and small differences within Christianity. There are those who would seek to do our faith harm. And Peter says, be on your guard. Be on the lookout. Be aware. And we've already seen how they can be identified in verses 1, 2, and 3. Now in verses 4, Through verse 10, we see that they will be judged. And this is a warning, not only to false teachers, but this is a warning to us. So may we listen this morning to God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 2 will begin in verse 4, and we will conclude really in the middle of verse 10. You'll see the break there, and then I'll ask that you join me in prayer. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued Lot, righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. And the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteousness unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. Will you pray with me this morning? Our glorious Father, we gather now under the authority of Your Word, confessing its sufficiency, its goodness, and its wisdom. Father, as we come to a harrowing text like this, our prayer is simple. We echo the words of our Savior who taught us to pray, deliver us from evil. That is our request, Lord. Deliver us from evil. May we be sober-minded and vigilant in this regard for the sake of Your glory and the sake of Your truth in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? I suspect that most lawyers and judges, even defendants, would tell you that those are some of the most anticipated words in a courtroom. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? The lawyers have done the best job they can presenting evidence, witness, testimony. The judge has deliberated as was needed. The facts have been made plain. The arguments made. The jury has deliberated and now they come back ready to share their findings. Ready to pronounce the verdict. As we opened 2 Peter chapter 2 last week, it was as if 
we have a courtroom. It is as if the defendant, the the false teachers, have been brought before the divine judge. And, And the evidence has been laid out. The evidence has been laid forward about their crimes and their sins. They have been charged with heresy. Charged with lying. Charged with deceiving. Charged with sensuality, charged with blasphemy, charged with denying the the, the master who bought them. The charges have been placed before them. The arguments have been made, if you will. And as we came to the conclusion last week of verses 1, 2, and 3, it was as if the divine judge, who is also the divine jury, rendered his verdict. It was as though God Himself spoke last week and says, as to the charge of heresy, these false teachers are guilty. As to the charge of lying, guilty. Blasphemy, guilty. Leading men and women astray from the truth, guilty. Denying the Lord and Savior who bought them, guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And Peter concluded and left no doubt as to the guilt of these false teachers. But as is true in our own court system today, there sometimes is a a, a span of time between the rendering of the verdict and the actual sentence, the beginning of the punishment. Even in our own court system, sometimes the the, the verdict will be read, guilty, 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 and then a, a, a later date will be planned for the sentencing. A separate court date, a few days, maybe even a week later, before those charges are are, are birthed into the the, the sentence, the punishment that comes upon them. If you came to a a victim during that time, the, the person who was hurt by the individual, what did you think about the case? Well, I'm thankful the truth came out. I'm thankful they were found guilty. I'm thankful that those things have taken place. But you might say during that, that span of time before the sentencing has taken place, but, but don't you feel cheated? I mean, they haven't been punished yet. They've only been pronounced guilty. There's, there, that hasn't even taken place. And, and the person would say, I understand that, but my hope, my, my, my confidence is in the fact that that judgment day, that day of sentencing is coming. It's on the calendar. I have it circled. And I know that on that day, justice will be served and the guilty verdict will bear the fruit of their punishment. God has made it plain and clear in this text that as to false teachers, they're guilty, 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 guilty. And now Peter comes and says, but but church, I want you to realize something. We are right now in the middle of this sort of waiting period before the sentencing comes. The final punishment has yet to come. The guilty verdict hasn't completely been, 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 been turned over into their, their sentencing. And Peter is saying, that's coming, that's ahead, but let's understand that we're right here in the middle of this time, this, this frame, waiting for that day to come. And Peter says, and some of you are going to, to think, just naturally, is that day ever going to come? Is it ever going to arrive? Why is it that false teachers seem to be multiplying and their influence seems to be growing? This doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. Other religions are growing by leaps and bounds. The church doors are closing and congregations are folding. It doesn't seem right, God. And Peter would come and remind us we are in this time and we must endure with great patience for that final sentencing to come. Interestingly, our text this morning From verse 4 to the middle of verse 10, if you notice, it's one gigantic sentence. Just one sentence. In in the Greek and in most English translations, it's that way. I'm reading the NASB. It's 166 words long. I'm writing my dissertation now, and like if I write a sentence more than 40, I get in trouble uh, from my professor. So... But Peter's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he can write what he wants. And this is 160 plus words long. To make his point. Now, when you come to a sentence that's this gigantic, you can quickly get lost in it, can't you? You're just kind of winding around. Where do I get to the point? 
Every sentence, though, no matter how long or short it has, it has two things. What are those two things? A subject and a verb. Very good. A couple of English majors in here. A subject and a verb. And if you can identify that, though, the rest of the sentence, no matter how big it is, will begin to make sense. We find the subject and the verb not in 4, not in 5, not in 6, not in 7, not in 8. It doesn't come to us until verse 9. Look in your Bibles there. He gives us the subject and verb, verse 9. Then the Lord knows. That's his point. That is the core sentence of this gigantic argument by Peter. The Lord knows. It's as though Peter is saying, listen, church, I, I realize that you're, you, 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 you're scratching your head, some of you, and you're growing impatient thinking, but we look at the world and we see false teachers growing. Their, 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 their influence is greater than it's ever been. They're selling more books and they're flying faster jets and driving nicer cars and they have more websites and more donations. This doesn't seem right. It seems that there's more error than truth in our world today. And it, Is God asleep? Has God forgotten about this? And Peter comes along and says, listen to me very closely. The Lord knows. And not only does the Lord know what's going on, His actual point here is, and the Lord knows what to do about it. The Lord has not fallen asleep. He's not on vacation. He hasn't changed His mind, though it's been 2,000 years since Peter's letter. He says there is still coming that day of sentencing. There's coming that day of judgment. And so even though we may have to endure a bit longer, church, with the influence of heresy, even though we may have to continue preaching and singing that which is right and feel drowned out by the voices that are speaking error around us, He says, persevere, Keep on doing it because one day the truth will be set forth. And the false teachers will be judged. He says God knows how to judge the ungodly and God knows how to save the righteous. What I find interesting about this is I think about this text. Really Peter's point here is this. He's not answering the question so much Does God know these things? The real question that Peter is answering here is, do you know that God knows these things? That's his point. God knows these things. There's no question about that. The difficulty comes in whether or not we know that God knows. He's not reminding God. He's reminding us that God needs no reminding. That God has all of this in view. God knows what He's doing. And let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. Isn't it true that so often the moments of of, of weakness in our faith, the moments of anxiety, the moments of stress in our life, don't they come when we forget that God does not forget? Aren't those the times in which we feel the most anxious in life? Lord, have you forgotten about me? Have you forgotten what's going on? Have you forgotten how to take care? Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? And Peter comes back and with two words puts all that to rest and says, the Lord knows. He knows what's going on and He knows what to do about it. He has not forgotten. He has not fallen asleep. Even though it, it may seem increasingly more difficult, even though it may seem like the church has to endure uh, even harder, we have to put up with even more. He says here, the Lord knows, and there's coming a day in which all of this will come to fruition. So Peter's point here it, to us, to the church, is don't forget. God's not forgotten, so we must not forget. Don't forget the Lord knows how to judge the ungodly, and the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. Those are his two basic points here. We see the first one here in verses 4 through 6. Do not forget that the Lord knows how to judge the ungodly. Peter here, as he begins in verses 4 through 6, marshals his argument by giving us this, again, this gigantic sentence. And the whole sentence is set up as a conditional sentence, meaning if something, then something else. If you notice how he begins verse 4, if, verse 5, if, verse 6, if, verse 7, if. If all of these things are true, then, then, why would we doubt this? 
there's, he's showing us a pattern here. In fact, it's a historical pattern. Peter's saying, listen, don't, don't forget the lessons of history, right? We heard the whole cliche. Those who do not learn from the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them, the mistakes of history. are doomed to repeat them. He says here, look at history. Let me give you three clear historical examples, Peter says, of when God exercised proper and appropriate judgment against the ungodly. He says here that God judged the, the angels, the ungodly angels, the ungodly generation at the time of Noah, and the ungodly cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And since these are all historical events, really the if here carries the weight, the thrust of a sense. It's not just if this happened, like Peter's doubting it. It really carries the idea of since this happened, and since this happened, and since this happened, and since this happened, why would we doubt this? Why would we lose sight of this? Isn't it true sometimes that that we don't see our life beyond our noses? And we certainly don't see next week like we should. We don't see next month. And we certainly don't see eternity and judgment day like we should. That's Peter's point here. Don't let this slip out of your mind. Don't let this escape you. Don't forget that there is coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day in which these things will be taken care of. He begins with the first example there from history in verse 4. Look in your Bibles. He says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, now, commentators are divided as to what event this refers to, the sinning of angels. There's two popular notions. I can't spend time on them. I wish we could. But the one notion uh, is in reference to the original rebellion, where, where, where Lucifer marshaled uh, an army of angels, a third, Revelation 12 tells us, and there started a mutiny against the captain of heaven, and, and the captain of heaven just threw them overboard. And they were cast out. And, and some commentators think it's in reference to that original rebellion. Others, and this is kind of technical here, but they'll refer to Genesis chapter 6. If you remember Genesis chapter 6, the story of the sons of God that come to earth, or, or the sons of God who see the daughters of men, and they find them attractive, want to marry and have children. And there's an argument there in Scripture that the sons of God are actually angels who took on human form and came to earth. And Jude actually has some interesting, um, can have some interesting support to that. And God banished them. That's Eventually, God sends the flood as a result of this great wickedness. Regardless of what it is, Peter's point here is clear that the angels sinned. They did something bad. And he says here, if God did not spare even the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So after they sin, God judged them for their ungodly actions, for their deeds. Notice what God does to them in that verse. He cast them into hell. This is quite possibly one of the most interesting phrases I have ever seen looking at the Greek here. The English doesn't capture it because it would be confusing to us, but he says here, he cast them into hell. The original Greek says he threw them into Tartarus. And Tartarus is a place, capital T. He Literally it says he tartarized them is kind of the idea. It's a verb. Not tartar sauced them, but tartarized uh, them. He, he threw them into Tartarus. Now you say, what's Tartarus? It's so interesting here. Peter borrows this from Greek mythology. You know, just to give you a point of reference, uh, Peter's book was written about 60 A.D. Greek mythology goes back as far as 800 B.C. Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. Remember that from high school? Way, you know, long, boring stuff. It, way back there is when it was written. And there was already this sort of mythology and mindset of how the world universe worked. And so in, in Greek mythology, this is the way they thought the universe broke down, that, that, that above was um, heaven or Uranus. Here was Pontus which was the sea, and then there was the land. So Uranus and Pontus. Below that was Hades, which is the place of the dead. When you died, you went there. And below that was Tartarus. There was Uranus, Pontus, Hades, Tartarus. And Tartarus, if, if, if Hades was your basement, Tartarus was a dungeon. Tartarus was a, a torture chamber in Greek mythology. Tartarus was the place that the worst of the worst went. If you've ever read Dante's Inferno, this is the lowest ring of hell, if you will. 
And, and Tartarus is, is the kind of place where the air is filled with blackness and with the howls and the screams of pain. Tartarus is a place of torture and judgment and chains. And he says these angels, they have been cast into this place. He says they've been committed, literally the Greek, they've been incarcerated. They've been cast into this, to the pits, to the chains of darkness, and there they have been reserved, still waiting for that final judgment. The point that Peter's making here of this description and, 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 and describing hell and this, this severity is that God did not even spare the angels. In other words, angels are above us, right? Angels, we're, we're a little lower than them. Angels are majestic and powerful beings that, that, that know the splendor, the majesty of God firsthand. And when they sinned and they rebelled, they did not get a pass. The angels were sentenced to like the worst possible punishment you can imagine. So Peter's point is, if the angels, as great as they are, got this, why would we think we would deserve any different? If God did not spare even the angels, what about us? He says, look to the angels of this reality that God judges the ungodly. He gives a second historical example. If that does not convince you, he says, consider the account of the the generation of Noah. Verse 5, and if God did not spare the ancient world, the antediluvian, the, 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 the generation at the time of Noah, he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. By the way, I think it's interesting here that Peter refers to Noah's flood as a historical fact and not as fiction. Some would try to convince us that, well, that's fairy tale, that's myth. Peter says, no, this is a, let me give you another historical event. Noah's worldwide flood. What happened in that day, Genesis chapter 6 tells us, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it was so bad that God, it says, regretted making man. That's a low point in history. And so God says, I'm going to send this flood. And the, the point here is that it was a worldwide thing, that it covered from the, the, the tallest mountain all the way to the lowest valley. It covered judgment upon everyone with the exception of eight righteous individuals inside the ark. His point here is, listen, that, that, that if God's judgment extended to the entire earth in that day, it's going to do the same today. It doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what country you're in. There's coming a day of judgment for you. There are some people that would, you know, sort of say things like, well, you know, my grandma, she's not a Christian, but she's just a really nice lady, you know. I mean, God's going to judge my grandma. His point here is that there was a lot of nice grandmas who were drowned in the flood. Because the issue is not one of niceness. The issue is righteousness. And he says here that only the righteous were spared. And so he tells us here, look, if, if God did not spare that world, and He did not spare the angels, then he gives a third example, verse 6, if He did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, if He condemned them, verse 6, to destruction by reducing them to ashes. What a great picture that is. Um, you remember when Lot and Abraham came to a place and they had to split up because their, their flocks and, 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 and cattle were so great? They, Abraham told Lot, you can pick whatever you want. And what did Lot do? He looked out and what did he see? He saw Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the cities of the plain, and what did he think about them? It was so lush, right? Green. So much vegetation. Such a beautiful place. And yet he was deceived by, by you know, looks can be deceiving. That may have been true of the, the crops and the land. But then Peter says, listen, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, though at one time they were lush and green, by the time God got through of them, they were an ashen gray. Reduced to rubble, reduced to ashes, nothing left. And notice what he says about this condemnation, verse 6. Having made them an example, listen, to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. We sometimes look at Sodom and Gomorrah and say, well, that's, that's all about homosexuals. That's why God was so angry with them. 
But Peter says here, listen, Sodom and Gomorrah is a reminder to all of us, to anyone, he says, who would live an ungodly life thereafter. My friend, if you're here this morning, came with a friend or someone, and you don't know Christ as your Savior, and you are living your life in sin, this is what awaits you, is the wrath of God. And this serves as an awful reminder of judgment. He says here, if God did not spare these, God will know exactly how to take care of these false teachers who are leading you astray. There's coming a day, look back in verse 9, then the Lord knows, here's his point, how to rescue the godly from temptation, then notice this, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. That's the false teachers in verse 10. They are the ones who are involved in corrupt desires, secret sin, public sin, whatever it might be, despising the authority of God, dismissing the Word of God. You can be who you want. doesn't matter. God loves you just like you are. You don't need to repent. You don't need to trust Jesus. You don't need to have all this doctrine. You don't need any of those things. Let's just, it, it, it's just God loves you the way you are, and that's all that matters. And they despise the authority of God's Word. He says here, they have been reserved for the place of judgment And they will one day be sentenced. I think we need to be clear on a point at this juncture. Because sometimes I think when we we think about the wrath of God, especially in such graphic imagery here, we sometimes make God out to be a sadist when He's not. You know, we, we sometimes imagine God as if, like the little boy on the sidewalk on the hot summer day with a magnifying glass, just burning ants, you know, for the fun of it. We sometimes think when we, about the wrath of God, this is, this, is what, this is what's going on. This is not what's going on. Ezekiel tells us, listen, that the Lord takes no delight in the death of the wicked. Do you understand that? I mean, the day that, that, that bin Laden was killed, there may have been cheering in the streets of America. There was no cheering on the streets of heaven. Was it right? Absolutely. Romans 13. But God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Even in the death of false teachers. You say, then how is it that God's doing this? Why is this so severe and so graphic? Here's one. Let me put it to you by analogy. Have you ever eaten food that that you didn't really like? Didn't care for? You know, as a kid, it was gross. Brussels sprouts or something like that. My wife likes Brussels sprouts. I do not. We probably all got foods like that we did not like to eat. Something that just turned your stomach and you just, ooh, you're repulsed by it. And what did you do when you'd take a bite of that and you, your mom or dad made you eat it and you'd start to eat it and go in your mouth and you'd smell it and you'd start to taste it? What did, what did, what did you do? You know, you start to gag, right? I won't demonstrate that for us. I think we all know what it is. But you have a gag reflex, right? Because your mouth and your nose and your taste buds go, ooh, I don't want anything to do with that. And so you're, you're nat- you can't control it. Your natural response is you have to really suppress it. But your, your instinct, right, because of your taste buds, because of the way they are, your instinct is to recoil and to kick it out. Listen to me. This is what we have in the death of the wicked and the punishment of men and women. God is so unbelievably holy and so indescribably perfect. His perfections are so great and so far and so wide that when even the smallest bit of of, of putrid sin comes near Him, the, the gag reflex of His holiness is wrath. Do we understand that? It's God can't help Himself because of His because of His holiness. It's, it's the natural response of God against any amount of sin. It's not that God's a sadist just bonking people on the head. This is how perfect and, and, and absolutely wonderful and, and, and sinless our God is that even the smell of it just turns His stomach, if you will, and His natural response is one of wrath. You say, what does that have to do with anything? This is why it is so important that we hide ourselves and celebrate what Christ has done for us. 
Because it was there on the cross that Christ endured the wrath of God. I mean, the, the imagery here of this text against false teachers, it's so graphic. But, but the language here just barely scratches the surface. The language, if you think of the wrath of God in terms of blackness and dungeons and torture chambers and howling and screaming and pain and, and fire, if you think of it as brimstone and ashes and drowning and suffocating, it, it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the horrors of God's judgment. Which is precisely why what Jesus has done is so wonderful and so precious and must never, ever, ever be forgotten. And why we can't move beyond the gospel like I prayed a prayer, I got saved, now I'm just going to be a good person. No, we constantly come back to the gospel and we celebrate this fact and we worship in this fact, we give in this fact, we go on mission trips all in light of the fact of what Christ has done. Which leads us perfectly to Peter's second point here. The Lord knows how to judge the ungodly, but He also knows how to rescue the godly. He knows how to rescue the godly. Look at verse 7. He adds one more situation to this. And if or since He rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men. By the way, it's interesting that three times in this text, Peter calls uh, calls Lot righteous. If you read the Old Testament... Lot doesn't seem that all, all too righteous to me. He makes some pretty bad decisions in the Old Testament. But Peter says three times here, Lot was a righteous man, Lot was a righteous man, Lot was a righteous man. And by the way, Lot was a righteous man in the same way that Abraham was. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's not because Lot was a, a self-reliant, self-righteous, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't do bad things person. Every man, every woman who has ever been saved has been justified by faith. So what does that mean? What that means is that even men and women who have been justified by faith can do really bad things. Even Lot, as a righteous man, could still do some pretty awful things and make some pretty bad decisions. And this is why we, as God's people, are to love one another and encourage one another and keep each other accountable towards godliness. He says here, if, rescue, if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. This is Sodom and Gomorrah around him. Then listen to verse 8. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. You know what that means? It means that when Lot was standing around at the water cooler, he didn't laugh along with the jokes. The other people laughed at. Lot didn't just sort of flip around the TV. Well, there's nothing good on, so I'll just watch this. I know I probably shouldn't, but... No, Lot, his soul was tormented by the sin, the pervasive sin in the culture around him. He was so sensitive to it that it says here it, it, it tormented his soul. He, he was not casual about the sin that he saw around him. His soul was burdened by that. Christian brother, Christian sister, is this, can this be said of you? Or is it fun to keep sin like a pet on a leash, you know? Or even to, to, to enjoy sin vicariously. That's why sometimes we watch the movies we do and because we, we're not sinning, but we get to watch other people do it. Lot was tormented by this, by even seeing it. And so verse 9, so what does the Lord do? The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. This is our hope, right? That our God knows, that our God is able, that our God can deliver us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is able that with the temptation to give you a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. God gave him a way of escape. Lot, get up with your family and leave before I rain down brimstone on the city. Noah, here's an ark. Get inside. I'm going to rain down judgment in the clouds. The way of escape was provided. The way of escape was provided. The way of escape was provided. So what about you and me? The way of escape for us has been provided in Jesus. In Christ. 
You say, you say this all the time. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm intensely trying to remind us to celebrate Christ as a person, as a living, breathing Savior who is coming again to deliver us once and for all. That is a reality. That one day the, the aches and pains of this life will be gone. One day the, 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 the filth that we see in our world that's promoted and celebrated will be gone. And we will live in joy and perfection in the presence of our perfect God. They are protected by the righteousness of Jesus. This is the, the part of John 3.16 that we skip sometimes. That's his point here. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him, what? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, we jump to the everlasting life because that's, that's awesome. That's good. And it is. But notice the treasure we have before that, that we shall not perish. So my friend, even though your body is growing old and one day you're going to die, guess what? Even in dying, you will live. He says we shall not perish. He tells us here that the false teachers, they're guilty, 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 guilty. The verdicts come down. The day of judgment, though, has not yet come. The day of sentencing is yet to be. So why are we here in the middle of this? It's very clear. Later in 2 Peter chapter 3, he tells us the reason we are here is why? Because God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patient right now. But my friends, there is one day when His patience is going to run out. And the trumpet will sound and the day will come when His patience is no more and His wrath and His judgment comes. My friend, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, I beg of you to trust Him today. Don't trust yourself. Don't look for the pleasures of sin. Sin, yes, it will delight, but it will not satisfy you. Only Christ can satisfy you. And your brother... And sister, Christian brother and sister, God has not forgotten. He knows the pain. He knows the difficulty. He knows the trials. He knows what you're struggling with, that you hate your sin. He knows these things. And He is there to provide you with the grace and the strength to endure day by day. Look to Him, afresh and anew, so that we can walk in godliness as He desires. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for this reminder that You have not forgotten. Oh Lord, we pray that we would be ourselves reminded that You know. Lord, we look forward to that day, that wonderful, marvelous day when Your good judgment, when Your holy judgment will come upon the wicked. Father, we see what seems like an increase in the wickedness of our world. And we long for righteousness. Stir that within us, God. Make us sensitive to sin in our own hearts and the hearts and the lives of those around us. But Lord, may that be accompanied with compassion and a longing to trust Christ afresh and anew day by day. Help us to persevere in this faith, to persevere to the very, very end. Thank You for Jesus who bore the wrath of God so that we might be safe, rescued, delivered through His blood. We thank You, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.